let's get started my presentation. This piece can look up degradation and upon it then see hash. Uh, I'm Kunuki, working for AWS in Amazon Linux kernel team. My mission is to make Amazon Linux kernel uh, stable, performant, and secure. Uh, we usually maintain our own kernels and package it for our customers. And we usually troubleshoot kernel-related issues reported by external and internal customers. And I will talk about TCP Planet NSC hash that improves some of our workloads. And what I want to talk about is basically three parts. How TCP scats were managed, TCP scat lookup degradation, and TCP panel NFC hash. Okay, let's move on to the first part. Uh, when application communicates over TCP IP, the call will look like this. At first, both server and client call the scat system calls and then the sub application called bind to assign IP address and port to the SCAT and the following system, uh, listen system call starts, uh, makes, the, uh, makes the server start. And then client uh, calls connect to establish a connection to the destination IP address and port. In this part, I will walk you through these four system calls to describe how the kind of manages a SCAT. The first is SCAT system call. Uh, depending on the argument, it, it allocates various struct uh, that represents the specified protocol. And they have the same base struct as the first member, that is struct SOC. And it has enough fields to represent a network SCAT layer. After that, the kernel returns the corresponding file descriptor to the user space. Then, the application can access the SCAT via the file descriptor, but other processes cannot unless the same file descriptor is shared. Next is the bind system call. When we call the bind system call with an IP address and port, the kernel set them to the SCAT. And then, uh, recaps uh, conflicting SCAT in bhash. bhash is a hash table, and all binded SCATs are linked in the bhash. Here, the kernel checks if a SCAT in bhash conflicts with the specified address and port, and if the address and port can be shared by other SCATs. For example, uh, if a SCAT is bound to a while look at address, like 0.0.0, .0 on the same port, the SCAT uh, the bind uh, SCAT conflict with the bind request, so the bind system call will fail with e address in use error. As bhash is a hash table, the kernel will, uh, when kernel look up the SCAT in bhash, it computes a hash with a local port and networking namespace. And it is calculated by inet bhash fn. And bhash is composed of two different lists. The kernel first looks up a bucket of SCATs with the same networking namespace and local port. Then it iterates the SCATs and checks each SCAT source address, source port, and SRE address option, SRE support option, and etc. Then uh, checks if the bind system call is valid or not. Finally, if there is no conflict, the kernel puts the SCAT into bhash. This time, the SCAT is prepended in the corresponding bucket. And the bind call, system call returns zero, which means the SCAT is bound to the IP address and port and also linked in the bhash. Next uh, is the listening system call. When we call listen system call, it changes the SCAT state to TCP listen. But at this moment, the SCAT does not actually work as a server. And this is preparation for the next step. And the kernel checks bhash again for conflict. It's because another SCAT could have listen on the same port and IP address. Let's say two SCATs have the SREs at less option then they can, bond, they can be bound to the same address and port, but they cannot listen on the same port. 
And if there is no conflict, the kernel will put the scale into L hash. Uh, literally, L hash is also a hash table. And the kernel calculates an index from the sketch net NS and local port. Unlike bhash, L hash bracket is directly linked to, to the sockets. And the new sket is also prepended to the sket, uh, to the list. Okay. Oh. And then the sket actually starts as a server. And the incoming sim packets will be distributed to this socket. And the next is connect system call. When we call connect, uh, the sket is not bound to any local address in the port in this case. So the kernel, sket, uh, kernel selects an IP address from, uh, based on the destination address. And now the sket has three tuple, destination IP address, destination port, and source IP, source IP address. So the kernel searches for an available port in bhash and if an available port is found, the kernel uh, copies the four tuples to the sket. And finally, it put the sket into bhash and ehash. And ehash's key is a five tuple, net ns, local address, local port, and following address and following port. As well as the lhash, ehash, each bucket is directly linked to the sket. And this time, also, the sket is prepended to the list. Then the kernel starts three-way handshake to initiate a TCP connection. The client sends a SIM packet to the server, and the server rooks up a sket in eHash first. However, this time, no sket is found that matches the five tuples. So the kernel looks up a listening sket that matches the packets, destination, address, and a port. If a proper listening sket is found, the kernel creates a mini sket, uh, which has less field than the struct sock to mitigate sync flooding. The kernel does not allocate a full sket for clients until three-way handshake complete, and the connection is proved not to be malicious. So when receiving sync packet, it allocates a mini sket and put it into the eHash so that it will be Rooked up against the following arc again from the client. And the server responds to the client by SYNNAC. When the client receives a SYNNAC, uh, it finds a corresponding sket in eHash, which is initiated the three way handshake. Then it sends out the arc for SYNNAC. Finally, when the server receives the arc, it finds a mean sket that was created at receiving sim packet. Then the kernel creates a full sket and copy all attributes from the listening cat. And it put it oh, put it into eHash. But this time the there is a mean sket that has the same five tuple. So it will be replaced by the first sket. And after three-way handshake complete, the connect system call returns zero. Uh, to wrap up this section, uh, the kernel has three hash tables, bhash, lhash, and ehash. All bound sketch exist in bhash to validate uh, the following bind system calls. And, and lhash and ehash have listening and establishing or established sketch respectively. And they are used to rook up scats that is responsible for incoming packets. But this is a story before Linux 4.16. And there were some problems found in uh, kind of heavy workloads. Uh, that is what I talk about in the next section. This B scat lookup degradation. B hash, L hash, and E hash are basically alleys of linked list. So the longer the list gets, the longer it looks up or traverse takes. It means the performance of such rookups can drop along the length of the list. 
So we have to know when and how the list gets long, and it depends on each hash key. Let's take a look at uh, LHash first, and whose hash is computed by NetNS and local port. For LHash, the hash is calculated by NetNS and local port, but in the same networking namespace, it is just a one tuple hash. Let's say we create multiple scats in the same networking namespace, and they are bound to different addresses with the same port. Then all of the scats are put into the same buckets in LHash. This happens on the famous port, like 80 port or 443. And SRE support option makes the list even longer. SRE support option enable uh, multiple scat to listen on the same port. And this is often used in NGX or Apache web server. In this diagram, uh, scat listening on IP1 and a port is placed at the tail of the list, which is the oldest scat because we usually prepend the scat into the list. So looking up an old scat takes longer than others. In such a situation, looking up a listener for same packet takes much time, and thus uh, the kernel gets prone to sim flooding attacks. Actually, this issue was reported by Meta, and they added changes that introduces LHash2 in 4.16. Its hash key is calculated by NetNS local port and local address. It's so three tuples. Adding additional element into hash breaks down the long list into small lists. And they are in the different buckets. So let's say multiple scats are listening on the same port. If the local address are different, they always exist in different lists in LHash2. The LHash2 is initially replaces the sim processing usage and later other usage like block net TCP or something is replaced. And finally, five dot, in 5.19, LHash was retired. As LHash2 computer hash with the SCAT address, so SYN requires at most two lookups to find out the corresponding listener if the listener is listening on a wild card address. So LHash has a problem due to the its poor hash key. And it has to resolve the issue by computing a hash with local address. And here you will realize that the B hash has the same hash key with LHash, and there could be a similar problem. And yeah, there are some uh, same kind of problem. BHash also gets longer if multiple scats are bound to different IP address and the same port in the same networking namespace. And in the case of BHash, in addition to the SRU spot option, the SRU address option could make the things worse. With SRU spot, uh, with SRU address option, multiple scats can be bound to the same address and port. The option is primarily for client use case, like FTP server. When we have FTP server running in the active mode, it creates a client scat. Uh, for data connection, and its local port is always 20. So they have to bind scats on the same local port by SRE less option. But I think uh, this problem usually happens with the server workers with SRE port. And also there are two differences between LHash and BHash. When iterating over the list, uh, we use LCU for LHash but we have to acquire spin lock for bhash. And another point is that we have to iterate all over the list when the bind system goal succeeds. So if bhash list gets longer, 
the spin lock will be held so long, the process context in uh, so the basically B hash is used in the process context like bind listen connect system call. So holding the lock does not seem to cause a problem. But it does as reported by meta2. If B hash has a long list, uh, let's say on the 80 port, then a new bind system calls for 80 port traverse the list, then its spin rock is held longer. What if a new connection completes a sleepy handshake on the port 80 at the same time? Then the kernel has to add a new skate into B hash. This was done in the first pass, so it's done in the interrupt context. So bind system call could block the interrupt context for a long time, and finally the interrupt ends up in CPU soft lockup, and the connection will be dropped. And this was fixed in 6.1. With B hash two, uh, uh, so as we as with the B L hash two, uh, the hash key is calculated by net NS and port and IP address. This distributes get with different IP addresses to different hash buckets. However, B hash two does not completely replace B hash. When binding a get on the while lookout address. We have to check all skets on the same port, but different addresses. So we still need a list that has all skets on the same port. This is why we can't remove B hash. This way, B hash and L hash has improved hash key. Then the list is E hash. However, it uses five tuple for the hash. The five tuple is full identity that we can get from an incoming packet. So in eHash, all skets are distributed enough over the whole bucket, and there is no tendency that a specific list gets longer. If eHash is long, it means uh, eHash is just populated by too many skets. Then we will see some problem. Uh, why the looks up for the B hash and L hash is basically one shot, but we do look up for E hash against all incoming packets. So the performance of TCP connection degrades continuously along the list length. If the connection is long lived connection like WebSocket or database, so then the effect is not negligible. And there is another problem uh, related to networking namespace. Let's say two processes are communicating in different networking namespace. And yet another NetNS puts a ton of skets in eHash. As eHash is global hash table, all networking namespace shares it. And so NetNS cannot isolate each workload in this case. This can be caused by a single noise neighbor, but on a multi-tenant system with thousands of networking namespace where each processes have few TCP scats, we could see the same issue. Also, there is another problem. NetNS dismantle cannot catch up with such workloads. When a left count of networking namespaces reaches zero, it will be queued up for a single kernel thread that frees that NetNS in batch. When the kernel destroy networking namespace, inet TWSK page is called, which traverses all over the eHash and free time wait get in the network, that networking namespace. So if eHash has too many sockets, and NetNS is created at the high frequency, the kernel cannot catch up with this kind of workloads. And I did a simple test to measure how eHash recap from us in the regular days. The grace, uh, first, run IPAR3 uh, as client and server in different networking namespace, and just add a ton of sockets in different network namespace that does not transfer any data. 
The size of the e-hash is usually calculated automatically at boot time based on the memory size. And size can be uh, checked in dmessage. Also, the size is specified by a boot parameter, t-hash entries. In the test, I configure the size uh, as one megabyte and measure the performance. When the length is one, the throughput is 50 gigabyte BPS, but when the length is 64, the performance drops around 10 percent, and the length over 300, the throughput will be down to 50 percent. This is improbable, though. Uh, but 10 percent degradation can easily happen on multiple multi-tenant system, and. So that's why I added TCP, PANET, and SE hash. PANET and SE hash is available from 6.1, and it implements e hash for each networking namespace, which is not shared by another networking namespace. And it resolves the problems described before. The hash key, hash key is the same five tuple to reuse the same infrastructure in the TCP stack. And we can control the size of Parnet NS eHash by sysctl. I added two sysctl nodes related to Parnet NS, NS eHash. One is TCP child eHash and please, which is the size of Parnet NS eHash in child net NS. This knob has to be set before creating a new networking namespace. And the following cron or unshared is called see the values and create a new net NS with the size of Parnet NS eHash. The default value is zero by default, and then there is no behavioral change, so the global eHash is used for the childly net NS. This is because depending on what growth, the best size varies and there is no one size fits all value. Um, and another knob is TCP child eHash entries, which shows the size of current networking namespace eHash. If the value is negative, it means the NetNS does not use PARNET and eHash and use the global one. This can be used to test if the NetNS uses the PARNET NS or not. Let's see how to use the sysctl nodes. First, in the initial net NS, we can see that TCP hash entries matches the values in the message. And the ch child e hash entries is zero by default. In this case, uh, the TCP child e hash entry in child net NS is negative value. And if we set a positive value to TCP child e hash entries, the net NS has its own e hash. And the maximum value is 16 megabyte. And if the value is not a power of two, which is, will be rounded up. And if the system is running out of memory, it falls back to use the global eHash unless the OOM cura terminates the process. And when it happens, we can check it by syscontrol or roughly in the message. And I originally assumed the user of Parnet NS eHash was a bunch of small workloads in March turn system and a, fi and a fixed size is enough. But there may be a user who want to set a different sizes in different networking namespace. In this example, two syscontrol commands are uh, lazy and process L will not see an unintended size in the new net NS. If you want to use the node this way, an additional unshare is needed that create a dedicated uh, shift control nodes. And this is not modified by other networking namespace. And there is another notable thing. So the default value of two shift control nodes is calculated based on the Parnet NS eHash. So this, is, this requires careful tuning. And another thing, another notable thing is NUMA policy. The global eHash is allocated at boot time and spread it over all available NUMA nodes. But Parnet NS eHash is uh, 
allocated based on the current NUMA policy. So for example, in a test machine with two NUMA nodes, the global e-hash is spread it over the first and second nodes. But by default, the Barnet NS eHash is allocated on a single node until uh, you change the NUMA policy with NUMA control or like something. So uh, this is the summary uh, of Barnet NS eHash. It's an optional SCAT hash table of connection SCATs for each networking namespace, and we can control the size by SysCTL, and that requires additional tuning for related to syscontrol knob and NUMA policy. And it will improve SCAT lookup performance when you have uh, too many SCATs in eHash or long-lived connections with short-lived connections. And yeah, this the same feature is available in the UDP from 6.2. At last, I'd like to thank you for networking maintenance. They gave a great feedback and reviewed slowly. Uh, I appreciate their help. Okay, uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>